Welcome to the Cheating Secrets channel. We hope you enjoy today's story. Are you familiar with the idea of recognizing a person by their walk? Recently, I saw a woman entering a hotel, and her way of moving and behaving reminded me a lot of my wife Karen. Despite the dim lighting and limited visibility, her mannerisms resembled Karen's. However, I knew it couldn't be Karen because last night she was supposed to be at home, we talked on the phone, and she didn't mention anything about going out. Moreover, this hotel was far from our house. I was puzzled, especially since the man accompanying her reminded me of Darren, our boss from the driving school where we both work. It was hard for me to believe what was happening. When I arrived at the hotel parking lot, where I stopped due to a sudden change in training location, I realized that the presence of Karen and Darren here was unlikely. I changed hotels at the last minute, according to our preliminary agreement with this hotel chain. Earlier, I tried to contact home, but I only reached Karen's voicemail. Attempts to reach Darren at the office were also unsuccessful, perhaps due to poor mobile signal in that area. However, I kept trying. After parking my car and hurrying to the hotel entrance, I discreetly peeked through the door. To my surprise, I saw my wife and boss, judging by their small suitcases, embracing each other, showing a closeness that seemed more personal than professional. What the hell is going on here? They seemed very close and gave the impression of romantic involvement. I was shaken by these observations, sat on the hotel steps, my thoughts weaving chaotically, and my breathing became deep and uneven. I was completely stunned and didn't know how to proceed. But it helped resolve many doubts that had been plaguing me in recent months. Everything suddenly became clear. Changes in schedule, changes at work, and even changes in my role. I needed time to think everything through and analyze it. Returning to my car, I parked it carefully, remembering that as a driving instructor, I should set an example both on the road and in parking. Quietly approaching the hotel entrance, I made sure the reception desk was empty, and only then did I approach it to book a room. I had been here several times before and knew Kelly, the assistant manager, well. We greeted each other and talked about various topics, which sparked my interest in previous guests who had stayed at the hotel. Noticing that these people seemed familiar to me, Kelly mentioned that they were registered under the name Mr. and Mrs. Smith. However, her doubtful expression and slightly tilted head indicated that she doubted this information. She even expressed hope that they wouldn't disturb other guests with their noisy actions during their stay. With interest, I asked Kelly how often the Smiths appear at this hotel. Sensing my concern, she asked if something had happened. I carefully noted that it might be related to my boss, but I didn't disclose details until I fully understood the situation. I assured her that I wouldn't disclose any confidential information about the hotel or its guests, especially if it involved a connection between the woman I saw and my boss. Kelly accessed the computer system and said, maybe I shouldn't say this, but three months ago, they were here for a big conference or similar event. Back then, they booked separate rooms. Since then, they visited this hotel twice, and I've been keeping track of their visits because they used a credit card from the same company. I just needed to check the last four digits. It took me some time to sort out all my thoughts, and I decided to distract myself by heading to the bar for a pint of beer, it was an unusual morning ritual for me. When I returned to the room with my drink, I began to ponder how we ended up in this situation, realizing that a bit of additional information could be helpful. The driving school where I taught was in Salisbury, and we had a contract to train future drivers, including cars, buses, and trucks. Five months ago, I mainly worked in the Salisbury area, covering regions like Tidworth, Walford, and Larkhill to the south. Meanwhile, other instructors dealt with areas to the north and west of the plain. Cyril worked in Amesbury to the north, and Graham handled Warminster and its surroundings. It was an exciting job interacting with young people and observing their growth in a military environment, which reminded me of my own experience. For them, the transition from teenage life to adulthood was evident. The areas where our sessions took place were scattered around the edges of Salisbury Plain, creating orientation problems without the presence of main combat vehicles or large transport vehicles. However, Cyril finished his work five months ago, and a few months ago, Graham had an accident, falling from a ladder, which incapacitated him for a while, and left a gap in the northern training zone. I was tasked with temporarily overseeing the northern training zone, until a replacement for Graham was found, and until he recovered. Although we had other instructors, most of them were young parents without military experience. Shared military experience could significantly improve the training process. Despite the challenges, Darren assured me that this would not be a permanent situation. 
Karen held a position in the administrative department of our driving school, dealing with various tasks such as meetings, financial operations, benefits payments, and scheduling instructors' work, including mine. This made me carefully monitor the budget to avoid a situation where Karen would have to report excessive spending. Every month, when I analyzed our financial reports, I couldn't help but smile at how skillfully she managed expenses, always impressing me. Contrary to idealized notions of romance, Darren wasn't particularly attractive or fit, rather, he was average and overweight. This made me wonder why both Karen and Darren ended up at the hotel. However, considering the possibility that their presence was mutually agreed upon and possibly related to their romantic relationship, I decided not to interfere and give them space if that was indeed the case. But first and foremost, I needed to gather evidence to tell Darren's wife, Sheila, who also worked in our Salisbury office, albeit not as frequently. Keeping my job was extremely important to me, especially considering that our children were still in university. Reflecting on our life together, I recalled that our intimacy was at a high level before the children came along, we were ready for experiments and adaptations as needed. Naturally, things changed a bit with the arrival of children, but once the kids went off to college, our relationship improved again, except for the last few months when I was busy with duties in the North Sector, causing temporary strain when I returned home on Fridays. This made me think about Karen and Darren's presence and inspired me to devise a preliminary plan or even a strategy, depending on their reaction. Feeling unappetized, I decided to go down for dinner earlier than usual to chat with the headwaiter. During our conversation, I subtly asked how Mr. and Mrs. Smith would be accommodated to avoid being in their line of sight. I have visited this restaurant many times and I have developed good relationships with the staff. The headwaiter often gave me the opportunity to choose a seating place, and this time he discreetly indicated where Mr. and Mrs. Smith would be seated. Choosing a position from where I could observe them unnoticed, I assessed that the staff did not reveal my involvement in preparing the wine. Executing my plan, I watched as they arrived, exchanged hugs, which irritated me, and took their seats. After they placed their order, I signaled the headwaiter to bring a bottle of Macelle wine to their table, their preferred choice, on my tab, without disclosing the source. Observing the room, I noticed their reaction when the wine was brought to them, without a word spoken about its origin. Despite their conversation, including touches, smiles, and laughter, mostly from Darren's side, I remained unnoticed, realizing it was a chance encounter they couldn't have arranged for me. Her outfit caught my attention. It was a stunning dress that I hadn't seen before, especially not on her. Karen's reaction to the wine bottle indicated her discomfort, which, in my opinion, was a good sign. Approaching our usual time for our daily conversation, around 7.37.45, I stepped into the hotel's main area and dialed her number. Positioned to see her, I watched as she took her phone out of her bag, signaling someone about my call and the need to answer. After that, she headed to a quieter section of the foyer where there was no background music playing. To record our conversation, I plugged in my headphones and started recording, evaluating the convenience of modern smartphones that allow for simultaneous talking and recording. At the hotel, my attention was drawn to a young man dressed elegantly who was filming the surroundings on his phone. His actions caught my eye, occasionally distracting me and obstructing my view of Karen. Hello, I greeted Karen over the phone. I just wanted to inform you about a change of plans. I tried calling the office, but I was told you had already left for home. How's your day going? Your voice sounds somewhat subdued. Is your TV on? I lowered the volume of the TV. It's just background noise, you know how it is at home, there's always something happening even when you're not around, Karen replied. Your voice sounds different, are you using a different phone? Yes, I'm using headphones to record video during our conversation, I explained. I didn't know you could do that. What are you recording? Karen inquired. There's a guy filming everything in the hotel on camera, so I decided to capture that, I explained. Karen glanced around and noticed a man who entered the restaurant, filming what was happening on his phone. I was curious if she would understand what was going on. Her facial expression was mysterious, so I quickly changed the subject. Are you sure you're at home? The background noise sounds different than during calls from your landline phone, I observed. It's indeed your call, Karen confirmed, slightly embarrassed. I tried calling your landline, but you didn't pick up, I added. Maybe I was in the garden, sorry for not answering your call, Karen replied. No worries. This time of year is always busy. Just relax and don't worry, I advised, using a word I usually avoid. Listen, I wanted to inform you about a change of plans, but there have been some issues. 
Can I call you later? Of course, darling. Just try not to call too late if I'm already in bed, Karen replied before we ended the conversation. Yes, it's still early for you to be in bed with someone interesting, maybe with another man? I tried to maintain a serious expression, although I'm not sure if I succeeded. Oh no, darling, you're the only man I love, no one can replace you, Karen reassured me. So how do you know then? I thought I was your first. Are you always looking for analogies? Well, this time I'll try to be calmer, I remarked. From my seat, I could see her getting nervous and maybe even hesitating. Okay, let's go back to your analogies, I joked, ending the conversation with a chuckle and pressing the end call button. Her face expressed astonishment, as if she was expecting a final goodbye, I love you, but it didn't come. With the phone in front of her, she just sat there, seemingly shocked. While she was distracted and looking away, which wasn't part of my initial plans, I decided to seize the moment and approached her from behind, gently patting her shoulder. She turned around in alarm, gasping, and suddenly fell to the floor. It was an unexpected turn of events, and her fall was quite strong. I hurried to the registration desk and reported that a woman had fainted. I explained that I wouldn't touch her to avoid accusations of harassment. However, one of the waiters, upon seeing her fall, immediately came to help, lifted her up, and carried her to the table where Darren was sitting. At the reception, I inquired about who was filming near the hotel. I was told that it was an influencer. Upon hearing this term, I asked for an explanation of what an influencer is, and they explained that it's a person who documents various events, gives reviews, and shares them on platforms like YouTube. I understood that they were probably expecting free accommodation, despite not working at the hotel, and should have paid for their room, but were getting complimentary breakfasts. Personally, I find this idea quite senseless. Suddenly, I thought that the phone line was still active, and I could listen to their entire conversation. Making sure the recording was ongoing, I realized that I might have rushed and pressed the wrong button, muting the sound instead of hanging up after the call. Karen recovered after the waiter helped her back to the table. I quietly returned to my table, keeping an eye on them, but they were too engrossed in their conversation to notice me. John is here Darren. John is here. Exclaimed Karen. But he's in Laneham, Darren skeptically replied. I was watching him. He even tapped me on the shoulder. That's how, in one moment I was talking to him on the phone, and in another, he was right there, explained Karen, her voice trembling slightly with excitement. He shouldn't find out about us, it will really anger him. Why would he do this if he just leaves afterward? Damn it, he'll be furious if he finds out, Darren muttered darkly, clearly worried. If he finds out, then Sheila will find out, and it will ruin my life. I'll call him, he decided, reaching for the phone receiver. If danger had a face, you'd be dead already, warned Karen. You should have thought about the consequences before starting all this. But he'll never find out, Darren objected. Who sent us that bottle of wine? Someone who knows my favorite Schwarzkitz, Karen mused aloud. Something's not right here. Let's explain that it's just a business meeting if he's here, Darren suggested, trying to find a way to soften the situation. But why dress so candidly for an evening business meeting? Especially since I just told him I'm at home, noted Karen. Okay, let's say it's the first time, just a momentary slip up, nothing serious, Darren proposed. He won't believe that, Karen countered. Well, if something happens a few times, it's not our fault, Darren tried to justify himself. Several times? After that symposium in this hotel, there were at least three occasions when you coerced me, Karen objected. But you agreed, Darren countered. No, damn it. You drugged me and took compromising photos, Karen accused him. But you agreed voluntarily, Darren noted. You threatened me, showing photos of John and Kelly, and forced me to participate, threatening to expose them and drag me into it. I had no choice, I complied in a moment of weakness. It was just a way to pass the time while he was away, Karen explained with clear disappointment in her voice. It doesn't matter, he will find out anyway and will be furious. But you enjoyed it. Darren insisted. It was just a distracting maneuver. He's not home three nights a week, and coming back on Fridays, he's too tired for such games. You were just a temporary distraction. You're not as amazing as you think, you're too selfish, Karen expressed her criticism. But you like it, don't you? Darren asked, looking at Karen. If I have to do it, I can enjoy it. And with practice, one can become as good as John, she replied, excitement in her voice. That's when I decided to act. Considering our frequent encounters with young women receiving training in recording backups, all instructors had recording pens. Taking mine, I stood up and headed to their table. 
I heard Darren saying, I'll call him again. I hung up, but my phone continued recording. Apparently, he pressed the redial button because I heard a loud ring as I was halfway to the table, and everyone turned to look at me, including Darren and Karen. She momentarily lost consciousness, and Darren simply uttered, oh, damn. I sat down opposite them, drawing the attention of the entire restaurant. After waiting a few seconds for Karen to regain consciousness, I said, you're too easy in thinking about getting rid of me, but it will be much harder. John, it's not what it seems, Darren said. Then what is it? I asked sharply. It's a party to celebrate the new contract we just signed, Darren explained. I looked at Karen, and she looked at Darren with a skeptical look that seemed to say, what are you talking about Darren? Okay, I'll pretend to believe you, even though I don't, but why are you here, far from Salisbury, dealing with this office nonsense instead of your wife? My voice sounded serious. Turning to Darren, I added, and what contract is this? Tell me everything. Is this another excuse for you to leave home and be with my wife? His face turned pale. Karen sat there with a guilty conscience. My anger couldn't be contained. All my disappointment over the past few hours turned into rage. So, you arranged all this so that I'm not home three nights a week, working myself to exhaustion, so you can pursue my wife and sleep with her while I'm not there? You did all this just to be with her. I raised my voice slightly. You're a vile and despicable bastard. Just wait until Sheila finds out. At that moment, I saw the head waiter rushing to our table. In a restrained but firm tone, he said, Sir, you're a respected guest of this establishment, could you please refrain from causing a scene and disrupting public order? I glanced at him and replied, I apologize, Paul, you're absolutely right, but in my opinion, some of your guests like to have a good time. Turning to the head waiter, I noticed that he was recording everything on a video camera. I smiled and said, you can call this family drama in the restaurant that would be more accurate. Let them enjoy their dinner without interference, I'm sure your hotel will appreciate it. Addressing the waiter again, I added, I'll cover their dinner expenses. It's a negligible amount for the company, so don't worry about it. My appetite returned, and the Aberdeen Angus fillet turned out to be excellent, although the price was higher than we had planned. Karen seemed about to say something, but my gaze made her fall silent. I took out my phone and took a picture of Darren and Karen together, adding it to my collection. Karen raised her hand as if asking for permission to speak, and I nodded in approval. She turned to Darren. You told me that John asked you about the appointment up north. Is that true? Then, looking at me, she added, did you ask him about it? For heaven's sake, I won't get out of bed to sleep in someone else's bed for a whole year, I sharply stated, flipping my phone and showing them the photo I had just taken in the hotel restaurant, where they were sitting quite close to each other. Okay, let's discuss the truth, or this photo will go straight to Sheila, and your marriage will be at stake, I continued, looking them in the eyes. But what about that photo of you entering Kelly's secretary's room at 10.45? Why would you go there so late if something unusual wasn't happening? I asked, raising another photo-related question. Show me it, demanded Karen, addressing Darren. He handed her his phone and unlocked it, giving her access to the photos. After a thorough review, she returned the phone to me, admitting, he edited the photo to make it look like it was taken at 10.45. Look at the light outside, it's already dark at that time. Maybe it's the street lamps outside? Darren interjected. No, there would be different shadows then, Karen quickly countered. Damn, another deception, Darren expressed his disappointment. I asked the waiter to bring me a hotel brochure to show them the explanation of the photo. When I did that, Karen realized her mistake and confessed, it was a photo shoot for advertising, Kelly just led me through a room that was not my bedroom but an office. The looks exchanged between Karen and Darren indicated that they understood the situation, and the atmosphere became tense. She turned to Darren and yelled in anger, let's get this straight, you sent my husband away, telling me he asked for it, even though he didn't. You falsified photos, making it look like he had an affair, drugged me, treated me inappropriately, blackmailed and threatened my marriage and career? It took her a few minutes to compose herself, while it took me several hours to come up with a response to that. It's amazing that her slap didn't break his jaw. The whole restaurant, including the famous influencer, froze and watched us, and the atmosphere was filled with dead silence. The influencer kept recording. She was already preparing to slap him again, and I almost let her do it until I noticed a mater d heading towards us. I grabbed her hand and whispered, calm down, or we'll get kicked out, and I'm not finished yet. Seeing this, the mater d stepped back. 
While dead silence reigned in the restaurant, everyone secretly stared at us, preparing for the next episode, they seemed to be enjoying it. This is only getting worse, I said. Maybe there's something wrong with me, but here we are. I took a half full glass of wine from Darren and took a sip. MMM, delicious, you'll miss this. Schwartz Katz is also to my liking, I added, placing the glass in front of me. At that moment, the maitre d' brought me a steak and whispered insistently, be quieter, or I'll kick everyone out. I understood the hint and decided to make an effort to keep calm. I looked at the maitre d' and apologized, I'm sorry, Paul, I'll be more restrained at the table. I think he appreciated that I remembered his name. Let's start with what was a turning point for me. Cyril retired, and Graham got injured from falling down the stairs. This provided you with the opportunity to send me to the northern sector, where I was supposed to stay away from home for at least two days, but as it turned out, it stretched to three days. You knew I wouldn't let the company or the client down, that's exactly what you used to your advantage. You promised to find a replacement for me and handle the workload. I looked at Karen and asked, how many interviews has he conducted in the last five months to find a replacement for Cyril? I'm not aware of any, but he claims that you're satisfied with the situation and enjoying the extra money. Money can't replace time spent away from family. I drank a glass of wine to give myself time to think. Has he ever posted a job vacancy? I haven't seen such an announcement. Furthermore, he suggested you participate in a driving simulator symposium. Don't you think that his wife, who owns the company, would be better suited to make such a decision than someone involved in office work? But she was feeling unwell, so she couldn't go, and the hotel room was already booked, so he had to rent another one. Why was she sick? I asked. She's allergic to nuts, how could he give her nuts and trigger an allergic reaction without warning her? But considering his help to you, I wouldn't judge him. You poison your wife, you monster. He looked at his knees during my accusations, but now he raised his head and declared, I wouldn't do that to Sheila, I love her. Karen intervened. Then why did you sleep with me? She approached me and sat down next to me. I'm sorry. Can we talk about this? I finished another piece of steak, looked at her, and said, maybe later. Let's first address other issues. Okay, let's talk about the symposium and blackmail, I only heard bits of your conversation, I suggested. Karen told me that she woke up naked in Darren's bed after heavy drinking. He helped her stay overnight by offering his room. The next day, he showed her compromising photos and threatened her with dismissal and accusations. This information angered me, but I tried to remain calm. Leaning over the table, I grabbed his hand and placed a steak knife blade down on the back of his wrist. So, you drugged and raped my wife, you despicable bastard. He became flustered, looked at me, and said, no, 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 I didn't violate her. Why would I do that, sleep with someone lifeless like a dead fish? There's no pleasure in that. I took another bite of the steak, which turned out to be very tasty, just like the wine. I used this moment to calm myself but at the same time, to tease Karen and Darren even more. Let's move on to finances. I assume you're paying for all this? I asked. Yes, of course, Darren replied. I noticed how many times you stayed here with her, using the same credit card, and it was the company's credit card. Turning to Karen, I added, that's a beautiful dress. I can guess you have stylish lingerie underneath. I haven't seen that on you before. Where did it come from? She lowered her head, then slowly raised it and said, Darren brought it. He said it would suit me. It was magnificent, Darren definitely had good taste. And who paid for all these meals, dates, and sexy clothing him or the company? I suggest that on Monday when you come in, you carefully analyze his expenses just like mine and provide a report to management. There's one more question I want to ask. Why are you here, in this hotel? I asked Karen. I decided to use this as payback for what happened last time when you cheated on me, she replied. But I called Darren and informed him of the change in plans, after which I went to the next meeting. Karen's face turned pale, she glanced at Darren and said, you knew where he was heading, yet you still brought me here. You're a real selfish person, only caring about yourself, aren't you? No, I just received a message about his assignment, they made a mistake in the office. They thought he was going from Laneham to Warminster, not the other way around, Darren explained. Even if that's true. We would still end up here at the same time as him, Karen replied. But he didn't follow my plan that I gave him, I interjected, allowing them to discuss while I finished my steak. Alright, let's sum it up. Firstly, you used my loyalty to the company and the client to make me do things I didn't want. You forced me to leave home for three nights a week and work so diligently that by Friday, I was so exhausted that all I could think of was sleep. 
You deceived me about the job change, there wasn't even an announcement about a replacement. You drugged my wife and then took compromising photos for blackmail, demanding more sex. You fabricated evidence to convince my wife that I was cheating on her, you used company funds for your evenings and gifts for her. This is corporate theft. What will your boss, Sheila, say about this? You did all this just to sleep with my wife? Yes, he said quietly, nodding his head. Karen stared at me, frowning. So this is Sheila's company? A minute ago, you mentioned senior management. What exactly do you mean by senior management? I thought Darren was the top, it's his business, he's the senior management. I shook my head. No, it's Sheila's company, she owns it. Her father founded it, and he was clear that this person should not have any stake in it. He holds the position of director, but it's not his company. But she hardly ever shows up, we only see her five or six times a year. Despite his awful qualities, he seems to know how to run the company and fulfills his duties well. She doesn't need to come. But I'm sure she'll be interested in how he spends company funds, especially on personnel intrigue. I had never seen Karen so furious, she reached for the keycard to my room and said, give me the keycard to your room, let's not argue, just give it. I handed her the keycard without argument. If needed, I could book another room later. She left the restaurant. Playing with the steak knife, I turned to Darren. You'll do as I say, or I'll tell Sheila about what you two were up to here. Tomorrow morning, you'll call Sheila, tell her I'm sick, and since you'll be nearby, you'll take care of my affairs. I decided to take a day off to focus on saving my marriage. So when you return home tomorrow evening, tell Sheila that I've decided to return to studying and want to dedicate more time to it. Every two weeks, you'll take over my workouts. I understand this will disrupt the continuity of training, but we'll manage. Then you'll explain to Sheila that I'll take over your work while you focus on yours. This way, we'll have a plan of succession in case of unexpected circumstances, like if one of us wants to take a vacation or gets into an accident, I added with a threatening tone. He pondered. Are you sure this will work? I think so. We just have to trust each other. You don't want Sheila to find out about our plans directly, right? Yes, of course. But how will I know you won't betray me? There's no reason not to trust me. Otherwise, both of us will have to face the consequences, as we both want to keep our jobs and responsibilities. I'm not ready to lose my position right now, I poured another glass of wine, the mere name of which cost more on my expenses than the entire bottle. I looked at him. So what do you say? He smiled. I think it makes sense and can work. We just have to convince Sheila. I didn't like his smile. Don't forget that if our plan leaks, it will be unpleasant for everyone. We both like our jobs, but that won't stop us if we're forced. Then you'll write a letter to Sheila, telling her the whole story of your attempts to win Karen over, including the use of company resources. To soften the blow, I'll add my arguments, explaining why I decided not to expose you to public ridicule. Sheila is an old friend of mine, we've been friends for many years, and you were my friend too. I don't want any of us to suffer more, so I'm counting on your loyalty, and the letter will remain with me as a backup. At that moment, Karen returned. She walked a bit slower but still determined. She changed clothes and sat next to me, remarking, better this way, I felt uncomfortable in my previous outfit. I threw away all unnecessary things. And, Darren, I wouldn't advise Sheila to dig into your baggage, there might be surprises. Looks like I lost a pair of panties. Now Darren wasn't smiling. I continued, all right, now you'll stop playing games and be loyal to Sheila, because if I notice you continuing your antics, I won't have to bring up this issue again, I'll just tell Sheila everything you've done. Darren raised his head and shook it in disbelief. I won't write the letter. But I'll do everything else. I understood him. Giving up control of the situation wasn't that simple. I picked up the phone receiver. I've already recorded everything, and this letter will go directly to Sheila. Darren raised his hands. Enough, I'll handle it myself. In court, this letter won't be heard, and it shouldn't have existed. Its contents should only be known in conversation with Sheila. Leaning across the table, I laughed bitterly. Sure, boss will just drop everything now and write a letter. It's just that easy, I gestured towards Karen. She just has to save her marriage. Karen took my hand and looked into my eyes. Do you think we have a chance, really? When I came here, hell on earth didn't exist, but after hearing from both of you and learning what this cunning guy has done, it seems like it's here. But I'm still curious how you managed to deceive me with him, I pointed at Darren, who at that moment stood up and left. I was reflecting on this while I was changing, and it seems I've found the answer. 
It's about revenge, excitement, and lack of attention, especially in sex, which has been going on for four days a week already. I've been thinking about it too, but my thoughts are not yet complete, and some things may be tangled. My mind is all mixed up. There's no clear order. First of all, I sincerely apologize. I apologize for the betrayal and pain I caused you. And I'm sorry we're here right now. Although Darren deceived me too, I bear my share of the blame. Forgive me, dear, but there's something I must tell you, and you may not like it. You're not to blame for anything and haven't done anything wrong. Let's start with revenge. When I saw you with that cute secretary entering your room at such a time, I thought there might have been an affair between you while I was away. Darren hinted at it to me, showing a photo and asking what they could be plotting. Now I understand it was a trap to sow doubts in my mind. Now I see that it was fabricated. I was about to ask why she didn't decide to meet me face to face, but she anticipated me, leaning in and kissing me, silencing me. Allow me to finish, please, dear, she began. The next thing I need to explain is why I didn't immediately reach out to you when I found out I was drugged and blackmailed. I was thinking about our job and how to pay for our child's university. It's not an excuse, it's just something I should have done but didn't, and I regret it, it was my mistake. I'm sorry, dear, but this might be a bit painful, she continued, it's painful for me, and I'm not sure how painful it will be for you. I was experiencing a lack of sex. After menopause, I became very irritable. I know it's not an excuse, but it's all I have. And there was excitement, especially doing it in the hotel, where I thought you had betrayed me. Now that I know that's not true, I feel terrible. I tried to interject, but she placed a finger on my lips and continued speaking. I don't need your sympathy, I brought this upon myself with my naivety and foolishness. Gifts and attention don't matter. I never used the things he brought me or what we did together against you, she said, lowering her gaze. We never did anything that wasn't for you, in fact, it was just regular sex, nothing special. She paused the conversation, taking a sip of wine. Upon reflecting on it, I found the reason why I allowed myself to do this. I'll tell you about it later. I admit, I felt lonely, and it was nice to spend time with someone you know, especially when you considered him a friend. Maybe that made the situation even more complicated. I cheated on you with his friend. He provided good company over lunch, his jokes were quite decent, and I felt some sense of revenge, which added an exciting atmosphere to it. She smiled slightly at me. But in bed, he wasn't that good, he aroused me, but didn't bring satisfaction. I think he bought me clothes so I would keep them in separate boxes. How could I do this? Perhaps we should discuss this with a psychologist, but I feel like I compartmentalized everything into little boxes. One box is my work life, but there was nothing important there. The big box is my life with you, and the very small one is my connection with him. I think I kept them separate in my mind when I was with him. I didn't even notice the two other boxes, so they were insignificant. When I was with you, the work box was slightly open, and his was closed. It's as if there was no deception. I can't find any other explanation. I'm sorry, dear. I felt awkward deceiving Sheila, but I decided it was protection for her, keeping it a secret, another small box, perhaps. She took another sip of wine. Forgive me for the many words, dear. I have been thinking about how I can atone for my guilt towards you, whether we can overcome this trial together. My love for you is sincere. Can you forgive me? I understand that forgetting will be difficult, but I am ready to make every effort to help you forget. I'm ready for anything. Can we go up to your room so I can begin to make amends? Listening to you, I have already decided to forgive you. However, you're right, forgetting won't be easy. Yes, we can go up to my room. It will just be a conversation, and I'll let you know when I'm ready. A faint smile appeared on her face again. Oh, dear, our conversation has dragged on for too long now, and we haven't had a chance to discuss this. The last time I was with him was over a month ago, you were the last person I kissed, and even then, it was just a touch on the cheek. I realized there were things I could have done better. I should have been more insistent when he ordered me to head to the Northern Plains. I should have inquired about the hiring process. But she was right. Most of the blame lies with her, although the main fault lies with him. I told her that I had made an agreement with Darren not to disclose this to Sheila. I also mentioned that I would be home every two weeks until we find a replacement. This week, I'll be in the office with her, perhaps we'll have to catch up on missed work, which should please her a bit. I stood up and reached out to her. Let's find a way to fix all of this. Three weeks had passed when Karen and I walked into the office, slightly late due to disobedience. 
All the colleagues were gathered around someone's laptop, the atmosphere was tense some were stunned, while others chuckled. As soon as we entered, dead silence fell, and we noticed embarrassed expressions on people's faces. What's going on here? First laughter, and now everyone's tense, I spoke, breaking the silence. Well, let's see, said John, one of the senior team members. We found something on YouTube that resembles your conversation with Darren in the restaurant. It looks serious. This is just one of four videos, and we haven't even finished watching the first part. Maybe it's better not to watch the rest. Karen intervened. We can't dictate to you what to do, but I'd be very embarrassed if you find out what happened and why Darren is only here once every two weeks. Please, don't tell Sheila about this. Don't tell Sheila? What's going on? Sheila appeared from behind. Oh my god. Karen and I exclaimed simultaneously. Sheila took the laptop and opened it. The video's title was Husband Catches Wife with Lover in a Restaurant, and on the video cover, Darren was clearly visible, and upon closer inspection, my face could be distinguished too. Sheila silently stared at us, exhaling steam. You both are in my office right now. And she walked out. Karen and I followed her. I walked past my desk and grabbed a few things. I had been waiting for this moment, but I didn't think it would happen so quickly. I promised Karen not to tell Sheila about this. But who sent the link to the video to John? Sheila expressed strong anger. What the hell is going on here? Before I could say anything, Karen stepped forward and said, I'm sorry, Sheila, I ruined everything. She lowered her gaze and added, I was with Darren. Sheila leaned back in her chair. This is just terrible, I never thought you would make such a decision. Looking at me, she asked, John, did you know about this? I thought we were friends, why didn't you tell me? Now it was time for me to speak up. Sheila, I deeply regret this, but Darren deceived Karen. He found out about her menopause and increased libido. Then he made her think that I was having an affair, forcing her to spend three nights a week at work and exhausting herself by Friday so much that our relationship became almost lifeless. After that, he got her on drugs and took compromising photos, then blackmailed her. All of this happened at the driving simulator event where you couldn't come due to illness. Most of the story was beyond Sheila's knowledge, so I sat down and placed a letter from Darren, a flash drive, and a voice recorder in front of her. Karen also sat down. Sheila, we didn't tell you about this because we didn't know what to do. Should we tell you the truth and break your marriage or keep it hidden so you wouldn't find out? We thought you were happy in your marriage. I asked Darren to write down exactly what he did to Karen. He signed it. Then we explained why we didn't tell you earlier. Karen wanted to tell you the truth, but I assumed you wouldn't want to know. We didn't know this wasn't the first time it happened and thought it was an isolated incident. I warned Darren that if he repeats this, I'll reveal the whole truth. Here are audio and video recordings of that meeting you saw on YouTube. Perhaps you convinced him to return to school? Yes, I decided to stay home for a while so that we could sort out our relationship. Now I am aware of the whole situation and, for the most part, will forgive Karen. Karen looked at me with a frown, clearly disappointed by the for the most part comment. It's better for all of you to leave, I need to think about what happened. We left the room. Karen stayed with Sheila for about half an hour, then brought coffee to Sheila, knocked on the door, but receiving no response, cautiously opened the door and peeked into Sheila's office. She quickly entered and closed the door behind her. My thoughts turned grim, and I hurried to the office, seeing Karen embracing a crying Sheila. Karen waved at me, and we both hugged Sheila. After a couple of minutes, Sheila seemed to regain composure. She pushed us away and said, thank you, I needed that. Looking down at us, she continued, I just looked at what you left me. Now I need even more time to think. Please leave again. I gently shook her hand and said, forgive us Sheila. We left. As we approached the door, Sheila added, thank you for the coffee, Karen, I appreciate it, but I'll need another cup in 20 minutes. It sounded like a hint of forgiveness or at least a reduction in tension due to her actions. The rest of the day in the office was silent. Suddenly, Darren burst into the room and headed towards me. I already knew what would happen next. Raising my hands in surrender, I said, I didn't tell her, blame Mr. Influencer and YouTube. He veered off course and headed straight to Sheila's office, not knocking, but immediately entering and closing the door behind him, which only intensified the silence in the room. Ten seconds later, there was such a loud bang that it sounded like a sonic boom. The walls in that area were extremely thin. You're a liar, a cunning scoundrel. Among our colleagues, among our friends, you humiliated me. You're fired, Sheila's voice sounded, impossible to ignore. You don't have the right to fire me for this. 
No, I'm firing you for wastefulness, Sheila said even louder. But I love you. It was just a joke. It didn't mean anything. Sheila raised her voice even more. You're willing to jeopardize our marriage and your job for some little pleasure as well as our friend's marriage. Do you realize Karen can hear you? Another bang echoed, almost as loudly as the previous one. And that's for Karen, because she's too kind to treat you like this. Sheila apparently didn't know that Karen had indeed acted this way, although perhaps not as harshly. The shouting stopped, but apparently, the conversations continued, and they seemed one-sided. If she simply fired Darren, we would lose three instructors, which wouldn't be the best prospect. About half an hour later, Sheila came out of the office, followed by Darren. She pointed to Cyril's old desk and told Darren, sit down and be quiet. She scanned the room. So, you're all aware of what happened, and now some changes will take place. Firstly, Darren has been fired, but we can't afford to lose so many instructors, so I've hired him again as an instructor with a basic salary. If he's not okay with that, he can leave. However, he understands that if he leaves the company, he'll also lose the family home. John will take on all of Darren's responsibilities except for directorial ones, but that may change later. I'm not sure if this is the right decision, but for now, it seems most appropriate. Karen, Darren will be giving you in South Dakota card with tracker and surveillance camera data every day. I would appreciate it if you could conduct periodic checks to ensure he's where he should be. If you have any suspicions about his actions, please let me know immediately. Additionally, you can cancel all contracts with hotels, he will return home every day. John, since you know the location, schedule his shift so he doesn't overwork. Karen, you won't need to check his expenses anymore, I'll take care of that. He will pay for everything out of his own pocket until he returns what he stole from the company. He will provide you with all receipts, so be attentive to his spending, understood? Now Darren looked down, completely submissive to his wife. It became clear to me that the divorce issue was still looming. While I would have liked to seek physical revenge, I also didn't want to become another dismissed instructor and risk breaching my contract with the army. I was a patient person. Lately, I rarely traveled. Karen was trying to make amends before me. I didn't object to that. But now we had time for the entertainments she so craved. I awakened in her a sense that could be called excitement, although only the stationery store could confirm that. Sometimes we went too far. We were asked to leave a store in town. Who would have thought there were surveillance cameras in fitting rooms? It was an invasion of our privacy. Then a loud authoritative voice rang out. Please open the door, we know what you're doing in there. As we were leaving, I mentioned it to the security guard. Can we just say your wife isn't very quiet? The guard, opening the door for us, whispered to me, have a good day, buddy. If that voice caused me stress and suppressed my instincts, it seemed to have the opposite effect on Karen. We found a secluded spot in the nearby park and finished what we had started. After that, we headed home. The whole house was filled with happiness. Thank you for being with us and listening until the end. If you found it interesting, please subscribe, give us a like, and leave your comments. And we'll see you on the Cheating Secrets channel.